Evening everyone, tired but fed astronaut here to talk a little bit about Artemis 2, IFT2, and now IFT3, if it's still called that. Uh, long time no see my face. For some of you, that's, oh, thank God. I gotta look at it again. Uh, this is an off-the-cuff thing. Uh, I'm gonna try to do more of these moving forward because writing full episodes, as I call them, takes a lot of time and effort. So we'll do a few more off-the-cuff things moving forward. And for our first off-the-cuff thing, talk about Artemis 2, IFT2, IFT3. Nothing first. This is not the first, I guess. No firsts. So first up, Artemis 2 got delayed from November of this year to September of next year. The reason for this is for three big things. One, Orion's heat shield eroded in a way that was not expected on Artemis 1, and NASA wants to figure out why. This kind of should be an obvious thing. Apparently it should be done soon, the investigation. Uh, if I remember correctly, the heat shield eroded with intolerances, so that's good, but it eroded in a way that wasn't anticipated. So NASA wants to figure out why that's happening. Because the last thing you want to discover is that it's a massive issue. You know, you want to make sure you know what's going on. The second two are related to Orion itself. Now one of them is there were some short circuits and issues with the life support system that showed up on Artemis 1 that they're trying to fix. And the other is, it was discovered that during an abort scenario, so the abort motor activates and pulls Orion away from SLS, that there's the possibility that the vibrations of this would shake out battery connectors in the capsule during the abort. And if I understand this correctly, this is also an edge case scenario. Now, so what that means is, you know, an abort's hopefully unlikely, and then of the situations where the vibrations from that would shake out connectors, it's within, a, it's within the range of possible vibrations for an abort mode, but you know, you don't want it to be inside that. You want it to be outside that for the uh, connectors to fall out. So, so what NASA is gonna do is they're gonna, well, open up the capsule and fix it, which means, well, just their luck, it's one of those things like your oil filter, right? You want to change the oil filter on your car, it's, you look around and it's like, they built the car around your oil filter. So you gotta go, yeah, take it all out, make sure everything's all in the right spot, you gotta do all the documentation, all the paperwork, all the proper storage, and then they gotta put it all back in. And of course, putting it all back in means recertifying, and checking, and paperwork. Uh, I think it was an old saying during the shuttle era that a shuttle could not launch unless uh, it had enough paperwork to be taller than the whole STS stack. And I anticipate this will be true for Artemis too. It's a bummer that it's been delayed, but NASA's playing it safe, as they should. So it's disappointing. Artemis is taking a lot longer than the Apollo era, but safety is paramount. Uh, on, on my end, of course, what is my reaction? Because as we all know, I'm the most important person in the universe. It says somewhere on my, somewhere. Uh, look, jingly keys. Uh, so for me, obviously, I'm disappointed that I did, that's not happening this year. But I'm okay with this because on one hand, I'm probably going to the Philippines again sometime in December, depending on how things go with the person I'm talking to. Uh, so, you know, I need more PTO so I could go over there. This is great. It's in next year. I can save up time. What this also means is uh, this gives you enough time to get a job at NASA and maybe work on Artemis too, so I can sneak onto the site. I mean, go to the approved areas and do approved things. That, that's, a, that's a joke, future employers, just so we're clear. So Artemis 2 got delayed, and if you, you're, I'm the first person you heard this from, oh my goodness, you need better news sources. Uh, secondly, yeah, now, now that IFT3 or OFT3 is happening as early as tomorrow morning, so about 12 hours from now, we uh, should probably discuss what happened on IFT2. Now, if you're wondering, why am I talking about this still? You click on these videos. I'm going to keep doing them because you click on them. Don't reward this behavior if you don't like it. Uh, so IFT2's investigation mishap report came out, and so Starship... Uh, the upper stage, of course, because this naming system is weird. Starship failed for... I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, and to be clear, I don't follow this program as much as some people do. So, uh, 
So at seven minutes and five seconds into the flight, so near the end of second stage burn, uh, SpaceX programmed a liquid oxygen dump. This apparently caused a leak in the engine bay, and as we all know, oxygen is famously inert, especially around hot things like engines, and then it exploded, which caused, uh, well, fires, and then an explosion, and then FTS activated, which is, you know, mandatory for this. And then on Super Heavy, FTS did not activate. It blew itself up, which is not good. So what happened there is something clogged the liquid oxygen inlet. Uh, there's a few theories on what that is, and I'll explain that soon with my whiteboard self. Uh, but what happened is, so the liquid oxygen inlet to the engines gets blocked. So there's no liquid oxygen going into the engines. Kind of hard to turn them back on without liquid oxygen. And one of them decided to check out early and blew itself up, which then caused other engines to explode and it blew up the rest of the vehicle. And if you watch the footage, you can see this happen. Uh, now, this is a bit concerning to me, if you ask me, because if you look at Falcon 9, I'm gonna have a picture of it, I hope, here, you'll discover that at the base of the vehicle, right around the engines, are shielding in case one of the Merlins explodes and takes out the other engines, or tries not tries to take out the other engines, it won't take them out. I don't know what I'm saying, it's, it's at night, I'm tired. Uh, my stomach's been feeling uneasy lately. So, that's not good. Uh, now, uh, the reason I would suspect that they don't have the shielding, if what I've been hearing is true, super heavy's uh, super heavy and SpaceX has been trying to shed as much weight as they can off that thing, as much as possible. So that is, uh, that's not good. But, so, but why did this LOX inlet get clogged? Well, there's a few reasons, uh, and my whiteboard self's gonna explain it right now. All right, folks. Oh, and fun fact for you, a little bit of trivia. This is the first video I'm recording using a tripod. Yeah. So this question boils down to the fact that Starship uses something called autogenerous pressurization. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, isn't that how David Carradine died? Autogenerous pressurization is an alternative way of maintaining tank pressure in launch vehicles. Because as your propellant drains out of its tank, it's going to leave a void that you need to fill up with another gas or something else, or the tank will implode, which is bad. All launch vehicles have helium bottom bo bottoms bottles on them that maintain that squirt helium into the tank to maintain tank pressure at 35 to 45 psi. Now the example I've drawn here is a pressure fed system, so tank pressure is also 350 psi, and the helium in this situation is also pushing the propellants out of the tank. Now, there's a way around this called autogenerous pressurization. For the one I've drawn here, we have liquid oxygen and propane because propane's also good for this, but we'll focus exclusively on liquid oxygen in this situation. Now, liquid oxygen doesn't like being liquid at room temperatures, or any high temperature for that matter. So you can use this to your advantage. What you do is, as you drain liquid oxygen out of your tank and put it into your engine, you siphon a little bit of it off and run it through a heat exchanger over your engine. The exchange here is, well, the engine's heat goes into the oxygen, and the engine doesn't melt. That's a good thing. And that oxygen becomes gaseous, uh, gox, which is then fed back into the oxygen tank. Now, PV equals NRT, roughly speaking, which means you have a high pressure, hot gas going into this tank and it maintains tank pressure. Therefore, you don't need as much helium or any helium at all. Uh, the space shuttle famously does this, SL well, did, uh, I keep thinking of, you know, end of the mission. And then SLS does this, and Starship Titan also did it on its first stage. And you can use this to your advantage because you don't need the helium then. You can use the liquid oxygen and heat it up and toss it back into the tank. You could also do this with your fuels, too. Uh, for, for this example, it's propane, which has high vapor pressure. And, yeah, you can do basically the same thing with it. Methane's also good for this, which is what SpaceX is doing. Because what SpaceX wants to do is eliminate a vehicle fluid and simplify, relatively speaking, the system by eliminating helium. But on Raptor 2, this is different. Now, this is Starship, sort of. 
I wanna make a note here, the liquid oxygen tank's actually on the bottom and the methane tank's on top, but I'm lazy. Uh, Starship is also powered by Raptor 2, which is a full flow stage combustion engine that uses turbo machinery, which I have drawn here with unhappy faces because I don't like turbo machinery. Unlike my basic auto generous pressurized uh, LOX propane system, this uh, Starship uses the combustion products of the pre-burner, which is part of the full flow stage combustion turbo machinery. It's, I like pressure feds because oxidizer and fuel go in combustion chamber. There's valves in between them. That's it. This has turbo machinery, which is unhappy because it's turbo machinery. Now instead, this takes the liquid oxygen and the methane to run some of the turbo machinery in the pre-burner, which then takes exhaust from the pre-burner and dumps that into the oxygen tank. You can see a problem here already. Unlike the basic autogenerous pressurization system, which I'm gonna say this so many times I'm probably saying it wrong, that uses pure oxygen. This uses combustion products. Now, chemistry 101, oxygen plus hydrocarbon. The combustion products are water and CO2, plus any impurities, have little, like carbon monoxide, those, we'll ignore those, which are then piped, but hot, into the liquid oxygen tank. What I've heard speculated is that there is water being pumped into that tank. And water famously is not liquid at cryogenic temperatures, it's ice. So the theory I've seen postulated is that ice forms in the tank and clogs up the liquid oxygen filter. And that's what blew up the engine. Now again, this is what I have heard. None of this has been confirmed publicly by anybody. I understand that uh, Raptor 1 used to have just a basic liquid oxygen heat exchanger, from what I understand, and that was removed for Raptor 2. I don't understand this decision. I'm not part of the program, I don't know. But that's what I have heard may have caused this. I hope my explanation was good. If not, well, just, just a good reason to cry myself to sleep tonight. Uh, so what does this mean? It's again, still a failure. Uh, I don't, my goodness, there's so many people who want to rewrite the definition of failure so that SpaceX doesn't qualify. And if you do that, by the way, you're weird. You should probably do something else with your life, okay? Arguing online over the definition of failure to defend the honor of a company that, do, that pretty much has no impact on your life, let's be honest. Uh, that's weird and you should do something else. I'm gonna do a video on this, by the way, at some point in the next 10 years, because I'm very slow. So, IFT3 or OFT3 is happening tomorrow, hopefully. Well, for SpaceX, hopefully. Not for me, I have to go to the office tomorrow and I actually have stuff to do. I gotta be busy, I can't, I can't watch this, delay it. That's a joke. Uh, so what is this? Uh, so they've changed the flight plan for this one. They're gonna dump it in the Indian Ocean near Madagascar. Uh, the reason for that most likely is just, if it wants to land near Hawaii, if you follow the orbital track of Starship, it would fly over Indonesia, kind of go near the Philippines, a very populated area of the world. They're not gonna take the risk of another debris event uh, tossing bits of it you know, onto Indonesia. So they're gonna go there. Uh, they're gonna test uh, payload bay door opening, they're gonna test propellant transfer. I think they'll try relighting the engines again assuming they get that far. Uh, I don't have any concrete predictions on IFT3 because, well, I'm not psychic. I don't know what's going on there. And I'm not one of the weird fan channels who wants to speculate on things. Instead, I'll just say this. If FTS has to be activated on either vehicle, it's a failure, okay? Super heavy, if it does not do staging, boost back, and then splash down with all of its engines working, it's a failure. I don't anticipate Starship, the upper stage, to survive the flight because SpaceX still hasn't solved the tile shedding issue. There's a picture floating around a while back that demonstrated that, my goodness, they're just losing them. So I don't anticipate Starship itself to survive re-entry, but I would hope for SpaceX's sake that they get all the other objectives done. Because again, I don't really care about Starship, the launch vehicle, as much as some people do but I care about Artemis, and Starship's part of it. I will be talking about that, by the way. I'm gonna do the Smarter Everyday video coming up. I had to learn how to read to work on that, so, yeah, you know, it's taking me longer. 
Uh, I think that's it for all of this. Again, these are off the cuff. I'm busy. I'm working on this for the next Know Your Rocket. Uh, apparently someone turned me into a GIF saying, stop weird, being weird about this rocket. That's strange. Hey, uh, but Starship's ambitious. Have, have you considered that? Thanks for reminding me. Okay, so a lot of people will defend SpaceX's failures with Starship saying, well, Starship's ambitious. Yeah, Conestoga was ambitious. It blew up. Otrek was ambitious. It didn't work. There's a lot of things that are ambitious that work or don't. Being ambitious doesn't magically absolve you of your problems. In fact, it probably makes them worse because now everyone's going, oh, you're being ambitious now? Ooh, let's see this thing blow up. Uh, so again, and being ambitious with Starship doesn't fix the fact that the program's not doing so hot. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and repeat what I've already said about my criticisms of the Starship program because, because uh, well, you know, I don't want to be a one-trick pony on this. And I don't need to repeat myself. S yeah, Starship's ambitious, but SpaceX should, you know, make it work. A working vehicle is more useful and more practical than one that doesn't, no matter how ambitious it is or isn't. Okay, and with that, good night.